The young girl with light blue hair is being chased by a group of knights who seem to have orders to capture her at all costs. The girl is terrified and defenseless, wearing only a long dress, with no weapons, no items to protect herself, and not even any shoes. Fortunately, Lieutenant Catalina arrives to rescue her, ready to risk her life to protect the girl. However, just as things seem to be going well, they are both surrounded by another group of knights led by a man with a peculiar mustache. Despite Catalina's pleas for them to stop the pursuit immediately, the man insists that it is impossible and warns that the situation will get worse if she resists. As the man finishes speaking, the necklace the girl is wearing begins to cause her pain, seemingly triggered by a container held by the man. A container filled with a purple liquid and a gem inside. Catalina begs the man once again to stop, but he appears to relish her pleading. However, at that moment, the liquid in the container begins to bubble, surprising the man, as that shouldn't happen unless something has gone terribly wrong. Before he can figure out what's happening, the gem inside the container explodes, destroying everything around it. After the explosion, the man falls into one of the castle's pits. Elsewhere, in a peaceful farming village where everyone is busy with their daily tasks, the young man named Gran is chopping wood for his daily chores. Beside him, Aaron asks how Gran can endure such work, but gets no response. At that moment, a small flying creature, which looks like a mix between a dragon and a dog, appears next to them, along with Aaron's father. They chat about trivial matters, but their conversation is interrupted when they spot a large warship in the sky, something very unusual in that region, which catches the young men's attention. However, that wasn't the most worrying thing, as something shining from the ship was heading straight toward the forest. Concerned about what might be happening, Gran and Aaron rush into the forest to investigate. Once there, they notice no smell of burning or signs of danger to the forest. But as they venture further, they discover a girl lying on the ground named Diria. Once she regains consciousness, Gran asks where she's from, but she isn't sure how to answer, only saying she came from the ship. Diria then tells them what happened with Catalina, and at that moment, she realizes she doesn't know where her companion is, and begins to wonder about Catalina's whereabouts. Gran decides he will help her find her friend, but they need to hurry as there are monsters in the forest. However, before they can make any plans, some knights appear, and order Gran to hand Diria over. With heroic resolve, Gran firmly states that he won't give up the girl, and soon after, he begins fighting the knights, quickly defeating them. One of the knights, even while on the ground, throws a smoke grenade to call for reinforcements. These reinforcements were not only noticed by the knights but also by Catalina herself. They start running, only to be ambushed by a new group of fighters. Suddenly, Catalina appears behind them, using incredible ice powers to freeze the enemies to the ground. She speaks briefly to Gran, informing him that they are being hunted by the Empire. The girls realize they must escape immediately. Catalina says she has already prepared a small ship to escape the island, and they just need to hold on a little longer until they reach it. After things calm down a bit, Catalina explains that she can't give too many details about Lyria, except to say that she is someone very special. The Empire had held her captive for years to experiment on her, but after a long time, Catalina couldn't bear it any longer and went searching for her. This triggered the Empire's anger, and that's why they are being pursued. Gran insists on accompanying them to the ship, and they all start running as fast as they can to reach it before the knights arrive. Along the way, they encounter a group of people threatening a father and daughter for information, but Catalina swiftly defeats them. However, this was nothing compared to what they were about to face as they soon come up against a thick-bearded man, leading a large force ready to destroy everything to capture Lyria. Under the man's orders, a massive Hydra emerges, attacking the group. Although everyone tries to avoid the close-range attacks, Gran gives it his all to protect the girls. However, due to the clear difference in power, Gran is gravely wounded in the chest, losing his life. Unable to accept that it was all her fault, Lyria decides to stop being weak and do something for the people who helped her. She uses her power to revive Gran. At that moment, an extraordinary bond is formed between them, 
and Gran seems to begin understanding a little about Lyria's nature. However, the bearded man has no intention of letting that happen, and once again commands the Hydra to attack the group. Then, the two youths unite, and by clapping their hands together, they utter some words, summoning the creature Bahamut. As the name is spoken, a giant beam of light descends from the sky, and from it, a huge dragon with stone armor appears to fight the Hydra. No one there understands what is happening, not even Catalina, who seems to know all of her companion's secrets. After Bahamut's appearance, the thick-bearded man decides not to retreat and orders the Hydra to begin the battle. The two monsters began launching their attacks, while all the humans around them watched the battle. However, the dragon started dominating the fight. The man with the thick beard ordered the Hydra to unleash its strongest attack. The Hydra released a powerful strike, and it seemed like the battle was over. But then, the smoke from the attack cleared, and Bahamut was still in perfect condition, ready to fight relentlessly. Then, the dragon decided to retaliate, creating an impressive energy ball that ultimately defeated the Hydra and destroyed part of the mountain. Seeing that they had been defeated, and observing the strength of his opponent, the bearded man ordered a retreat, crying as he had to report this to the capital. Meanwhile, the villagers of Grant were astonished by the immense power they could witness from their location. Catalina was also shocked as she finally began to understand Lyria's true power. Then, someone said that they came down to help, not just themselves, but also Gran. After this statement, the girl touched her necklace, and the dragon disappeared in flashes that emerged from the necklace. After the battle ended, Gran collapsed from exhaustion. Then we see a memory from his childhood, where there was a letter sent by his father, talking about the power of wind and fire, great dragons, astrals, and people with power. Beside him was young Burn, keeping him company. The letter spoke of the astral island, and all these stories were greatly loved by Gran. From that day on, he aspired to become a celestial knight and journey to the astral city to learn everything his father mentioned in the letter. Although Aaron said they were just children's stories, Drake didn't give up. Back in the present, Gran regained consciousness after passing out, and Lyria, who was beside him, was overjoyed to see that Gran had finally woken up from his injuries. Later, everyone gathered in a room to discuss what had happened. Catalina explained that ordinary magic could never revive Gran. Only Lyria's power could do it. Then, when things calmed down, Catalina told her entire story. For years, the Empire studied primal crystals. Lyria was a key instrument in this research, but they needed all the resources to analyze the majority of her power. Lyria possessed the power of the crystals, controlling both primal and astral crystals. According to Catalina's hypothesis, the Black Dragon may have been on the island, and Lyria's power awakened it. Only astral power could do something like that. This didn't bother Gran much, who decided to join the girls on their journey. However, the news troubled his friends and family. When they heard that Gran would leave for the Empire the next day, they couldn't believe it. Then, thanks to Biron's comment, Catalina thought they might find answers to many of their questions by visiting the Astral Island. There, they could learn the limits and power of the Astral Gems, as well as uncover Lyria's past. Hearing that he could visit the Astral Island he had read about as a child, Gran was thrilled, and this journey became even more important to him. However, to reach the island they had to pass through the Fearsome Basin, an area filled with various types of monsters each more dangerous than the last. After learning of the dangers they would face, Gran's cousin and best friend were involved in a major confrontation, but eventually relented after seeing how important this was to the young man. The next day, the group set off on a ship that Catalina had prepared earlier. Although the start was a bit chaotic, and the ship almost crashed into a mountain, they finally managed to take off and begin their journey to the astral island. Below, all the villagers proudly waved goodbye to our group. Although the journey started off well, things became complicated after a few kilometers of flying. The problem was that Catalina had never piloted a ship before and had no idea how to do it. As a result, after some time, Lieutenant Catalina lost control of the ship and eventually crashed it into the ground, rendering it unusable. Fortunately, no crew members were injured, 
but they lost their means of transportation. A man observing the situation from a distance approached our group, but unlike what we had imagined, he didn't come to check on their health, but to inspect the condition of the ship. After examining the ship, he mentioned that Catalina should take flying lessons, then left without further explanation. Our group was a bit puzzled by his intervention, but they eventually discussed how to proceed with their journey. They finally decided to find a place to stay for the night and arrived at Ingana, the main island of the Paul Breeze archipelago, specifically in the central city called Hola. This city is a stopover for travelers moving from one place to another, so it was full of airships, which caught our group's attention. One advantage of this place was that it did not allow people from the empire, allowing our group to move around freely for a few days. While in the city, they entered a shop where Lyria ended up buying a travel journal to record the events of their journey at this new destination. The next day, they tried to rent a ship to continue their journey, but unfortunately, none were available at that time. While Catalina dealt with the issue, Real was fascinated by a giant ship that appeared before him. The man who had approached them after the shipwreck the previous day reappeared behind Real. During their conversation, they learned that his name was Rakan, and he used to be a Sky Knight, but no longer was, not because he didn't like airships, but because the issue was far more complicated than they initially thought. After the conversation, Rakan took them to a garage to show that he had repaired their ship and returned it, though he wasn't sure if it would function properly. He gave it to them, with the condition that they find a good navigator. While they were talking, two strange people with semi-anthropomorphic bodies, named Stern and Drawn, approached them, claiming they had an extra airship and begged them to use it. However, our group didn't trust them and politely declined the offer. The two strange figures kept insisting, but in their haste, they inadvertently revealed that they knew Lieutenant Catalina, raising suspicion. Drawn then offered to give the ship for free, but they would need to leave the island immediately. Since our group politely refused the offer, the two strange figures decided to force them out. Just as they were preparing to attack, Rakan launched his ship toward them, giving our group enough time to escape. Despite this, the two pursuers continued to follow them. They kept chasing them, facing several obstacles, while Lyria and the others searched for Catalina. However, Raquel helped them again, and they managed to escape. From a distance, a woman with apparent plant-based powers was observing everything. Later, Rakan successfully brought them, including Catalina, to safety. That afternoon, they received an offer from Cielo, the owner of the bar they were at, to rent an old Celeste ship, but they declined because they lacked a navigator. However, a few strangers in the bar suggested they look for Rakan, and the group decided to rest before searching for him. While they were on their way to find the man, from a distance, they saw a force called Furious, who decided they would burn down the entire island. Hearing this, our group was shocked and made a noise that caught Furious's attention, who then decided to burn down their hideout as well. However, from afar, Rakan started shooting at Furious, saving their lives once again. As Rakan fired at the soldiers, he successfully drew their attention toward the cliffs, diverting their focus. In that moment, Rakan shot at a hidden hideout he had used during the war, and Gran immediately understood the message. Without the soldiers' knowledge, our group snuck through the hideout, which turned out to be a tunnel running beneath the entire city. Once inside, they reunited with Rakan, who guided them to safety. With a slightly sarcastic tone, Rakan said that he didn't really intend to help them, he just didn't want his ship to be damaged, so he had to step in. Gran then told him they had come to ask him to be their navigator, but Rakan politely declined the offer. He explained that since childhood he had wanted to use the ship they had seen earlier, but had never succeeded. He began repairing it, and it took him years to do so. However, when he finally succeeded, the ship failed to operate and couldn't be piloted. The only ship Rakan would pilot was that one. Nonetheless, even though he wouldn't join them, he offered to teach Gran how to fly and repair the ship, which Gran gladly accepted. However, there was a more important and urgent issue that needed to be addressed. Furious wanted to destroy the island, and they had to do something. They couldn't just sit idly by. 
Finally, the group decided to return to the city, but on their way, they once again encountered someone who insisted they take the Celeste ship and leave. However, now that they knew Furious would destroy the city, they were more determined not to board the ship. After trying the peaceful way and failing, the person said they would be forced to leave the island by force. Suddenly, Tron began using magical powers, but Rakan fought back. Not long after, Gran and Catalina joined in, but they still couldn't face someone as strong as Tron. In the middle of the battle, and due to a massive storm, a large tree fell between our group and the two from Furious, causing them to decide to stop fighting. Before leaving, Tron once again offered the ship, and when he received a negative response, he assured them that Furious wouldn't be happy to hear the news. After the two left, Tron sensed something strange about the storm, as if Furious was controlling it. Furious then decided to take shelter from the wind, and they entered a castle, where they found a large group of people inside. They were taking refuge, many of whom were injured by the storm, and they planned to use the ship to leave and fight against the enemy forces. However, no one knew how to pilot the ship better than Karakhan, so he decided to take charge. As he and Graham approached a ship, they watched as it was destroyed by the enemy forces right before their eyes. Karakhan then revealed his plan. On the island, there was a true wind goddess, but everyone had forgotten her. Furious mentioned Tiamat, the goddess who was furious. The goddess was angry because everyone had forgotten her, as no one made offerings anymore, even though they still received her blessings. Furious wanted to see the island sink, so he was helping the goddess. Upon hearing this, Diria declared that she would fight Tiamat to save the island, even though she had no idea how it could be done. Left with no other choice, she agreed to help them. So our entire group headed toward the ship that Karakan had been repairing for years. Now, it was time for the ship to finally work. However, as previously mentioned, the ship didn't seem to want to obey. But Karakan spoke to the ship and slowly, it began to respond. The man then explained that he had some sort of ability to communicate with the ship. Returning to the main issue, Graham managed to see from a distance the goddess who, as described earlier, was extremely angry and surrounded by a giant dragon, a primordial creature. Moments later, Tiamat also saw them, and it seemed the war was about to begin. Meanwhile, Furious seemed to have control over the goddess, able to monitor Tiamat's level of consciousness. Soon after, the ship began to be hit by various shots, but it held up, proving that the repairs made by Karakhan were beneficial. However, the situation became much more complicated, and the shots were becoming harder to avoid, as they weren't ordinary shots, but ones that followed directly toward the ship. Even so, Karakhan seemed prepared for everything, and he knew how to avoid the shots calmly, once again demonstrating his remarkable skills in steering the ship. After dodging the first attack, and with a few moments of calm, Graham could see more clearly that Tiamat was becoming more awake as time passed, with a purple gem on her chest, very similar to the one in Bigatudo's container, and the one on Lyria's necklace. Once Tiamat was fully awakened, Diria decided to communicate with her through the gem. But it seemed the goddess didn't hear her, as she continued to attack in the same manner. Diria then realized that Tiamat wasn't acting of her own will, but was being controlled by the Empire so they had to do something to stop her. Diria then commanded Graham to act. The young man jumped from the ship, which was now positioned directly above the goddess, hoping to land precisely on her. The plan went perfectly, and Graham managed to shatter the gem on Tiamat's chest. However, he fell into the void. The goddess, now freed from the Empire's control, awakens and sees Graham falling. She saves him from the fall and brings him back to the ship, then gives a gift to Lyria. In the presence of the goddess, Karakhan seems embarrassed and vows that he will remind the people that their lives exist thanks to the goddess, and that they must resume paying her homage. Later, our group lands on the island, which begins to recover after the wind goddess once again blows favorable winds. However, even so, they cannot stop paying homage to the goddess. The locals promise that they will worship her again later. Catalina scolds Gran for risking his life in such a way and tells him not to do it again. At night in the bar, 
Gran and his team notice a diamond gift which shows an image of something that looks like a volcano or perhaps an ordinary mountain, but they don't fully understand. Cielo, the bar owner, approaches and explains that it is a fragment of the sky map, a relic from the celestial beings. Catalina adds that she has heard rumors that to cross the basin they need fragments of the map, but she didn't know if the rumor was true. Vern comments that Gran's father had many of those fragments. After seeing what they've found, Vern says it's most likely the Duchy of Vaults. Shortly afterward, Gran approaches Rakan and asks him to be the ship's helmsman. The young man explains that his goal is the Astral Island, which piques Rakan's interest. After telling the story about the letter from his father, Rakan decides to join them. Before leaving, Cielo gives them a task, saying that he can't mention who summoned them, but they can find that person in the duchy. The group decides to go to the duchy and then determine whether to accept the task. Elsewhere, Story is in front of a knight whose face is hidden. They both acknowledge that they couldn't meet expectations in that situation, but manage to spread rumors far and wide. After several days of travel, the group approaches a volcanic eruption and realizes they have arrived at the Abad. Seeing the city's progress, our protagonist is amazed and speaks about the ever-active volcano. Upon arrival, they meet Cielo, who says he's always everywhere at once, without giving clear information. He then gives them a document with instructions for a meeting that night. Before they leave, Cielo warns them to be cautious, as the townsfolk are very suspicious of strangers. He can't explain why at that moment, but promises to reveal more during the meeting. In the afternoon, our protagonist strolls through the city, but notices there's no one on the streets. As they walk further, they see people quickly shutting their windows and doors. That night, they meet someone who begs for their help to save Bale. The task is to find someone, not just anyone, but the Archduke of the place, Zaka, who has been missing for a long time. Before disappearing, it was known that he was in contact with the Empire. The locals began to notice the Archduke's absence and it became a major problem for them. The reason why they don't trust strangers is revealed. Seeing the importance of the mission, the leader appointed by the group finally decides to accept the request. They then split into two groups to talk to people in the city, trying to gather some information. At the end of the day, they pool all the information they've gathered. From Ghana's side, it seems the Archduke had been making large orders for various materials at the same time. Many say the Empire hasn't been kidnapping children. Some of the children even claim that Sokka once played with them when they were young and showed them magic tricks. While they were discussing this, a girl who could turn invisible was following them to steal information. The next day, the group left the city to continue gathering information, and the girl followed them again. However, her invisibility power was eventually discovered, and a group of goblins attacked them. After the protagonist saved her, the girl asked if they knew anything about her teacher, the wizard Sokka. Once things calmed down, they all introduced themselves, and the girl introduced herself as Lo, a wizard, and Sokka's apprentice. She revealed that her teacher started acting strangely after being in contact with the Empire, and later disappeared. However, Lo insisted that the rumors about her teacher joining the Empire to create something evil were false, as Sokka would never do such a thing. She then decided to travel with them to find her teacher. They headed to a mine, the only place they hadn't visited yet. At first, they thought the mine was empty, but Lo could sense her teacher's magic. Using her own magic, she discovered a hidden passageway. When they entered, they found a laboratory. There, someone appeared, claiming that the place was once the workshop of the Astrals. But before they could talk further, the knight they had spoken to earlier, the Black Knight, and the Imperial Advisor appeared. However, they stated that they were not attacking, and that they too were searching for Sokka, who had promised to work with them, but had disappeared along with their research. Essentially, what Sokka was seeking was a way to activate crystals using a machine. For that purpose, he was also looking for Lyria, just as he had sought out the Black Knight's puppet, a girl with light blue hair who closely resembled Lyria. After explaining this, the Imperial members left, and behind the group appeared a magical mechanical knight. Lo sensed that the knight was powered by her teacher's magic Sokka. 
but when she tried to communicate, it only attacked her. Fortunately, Lo survived the attack, but our protagonists decided they had to flee. They escaped easily, as the robot was too large to fit through the passage. Though everyone wanted to continue, Lo was too disheartened to keep running. She was devastated because, despite calling out to Sokka with her magic, her teacher seemed unable to hear her. However, Lyria comforted her, saying that when Sokka heard her voice, time stopped for a few seconds, which meant they might be able to communicate with him again. To communicate with the Archduke, aside from Catalina, it was noted that if there were metal guardians there, it meant they had something important to protect, suggesting that Sokka must be somewhere in the abandoned building. All these words motivated Lo, and she was now determined to continue her journey to find her teacher. They continued investigating, and along the way, Diria spoke affectionately about her teacher, whom she called the Big Kid because he would sometimes forget to eat while experimenting with magic. After a few minutes of exploring, Lo began to sense Sokka's presence more strongly, and they entered a part of the building that was very different from the rest, as it appeared much older. There they encountered a giant creature, and no one was sure whether it was another robot or an ancient being. Behind the creature was Sokka, but it seemed he was controlled by something greater, as he not only spoke about using Lyria for his experiments, but also failed to recognize Lo, who stood right in front of him. Then, the Black Knight and her followers, who had been hiding in the corner of the room, used the power of the Black Knight's puppet to awaken the giant robot called Colossus. Although our heroes united to defeat Colossus, none of their attacks managed to harm the robot. Then, Diria lent her power to Lo, and Lo's sword began to shine with great strength. She was finally able to damage the robot's armor, but at the same time, she was hit hard by Colossus. Lobo then started firing, but his magic was too weak to hurt Colossus. Diria helped again by lending her power, and the girl's new attack became much stronger, even pushing Colossus back. With the combined strength of the whole group, they finally managed to defeat the robot. After Sokka was freed from control, possibly by a greater force, Long confronted him and started scolding him. Upon hearing the small girl's voice from the Archduke, Sokka seemed to return to his true self. It turns out that Sokka's goal was to create the robot to protect all the city's residents, but one day he encountered a young child who gave him a power source. From that moment, his memory became hazy. After everything calmed down and Sokka regained consciousness, the Imperial group left without a trace. At that moment, a piece of the roof fell towards Sokka, but Colossus arrived to save him. Despite being weakened from saving Sokka, Colossus disappeared and transformed into a fragment of a celestial map, which Sokka decided to give to Diria. When they touched the map fragment, they saw a celestial island, which they concluded was the Auguste Archipelago. They decided that this would be their next destination. Before setting off for Auguste, Lobo joined them on their journey, hoping to better understand the world and enhance his magical abilities. Before leaving for Auguste, the group had to restock their supplies and met Cielo again at her old tavern. After informing Cielo that everything had gone well, she told them about a new mission. Despite their objections, she had already accepted the job. However, as compensation, they would receive a large discount on the supplies they needed. Initially, they were unhappy about being forced into this, but eventually, they realized they had no other choice and agreed to take on the task. They were investigating ancient ruins that had been recently discovered. However, they needed to be cautious as the place was filled with traps. Upon arriving at the site, they began moving toward the ruins, but after just a few steps, the floor started shifting. Within seconds, the ground beneath them collapsed, causing them to fall into a deep pit. As they fell, the group was separated and stranded in different locations. On one side, Lyria was with Catalina, while on the other, Gran, Lo, and Rakan were together. Both groups decided they needed to find each other, but despite Lyria using her power to locate them, Gran continued to get further away due to his terrible sense of direction. Both groups faced obstacles, avoiding numerous traps and battling small monsters that kept appearing, but they hadn't yet managed to reunite in the ruins. Meanwhile, two others were also avoiding traps and fighting monsters, 
but they weren't as fortunate as our protagonists. Instead of encountering small creatures, they faced a giant sand golem. Eventually, the girl and her friends arrived in the same room as our protagonists, and they decided to fight together. After several attacks, they managed to come up with a strategy. With magic from low and simultaneous strikes from all the party members, they were able to defeat the golem without suffering any injuries. The girl introduced herself as Mari, and her companion was Karva, and they were there searching for treasure. At that moment, the group discovered a room, and finally, the whole group was reunited. Then, the door guarded by the golem opened, revealing a large treasure trove filled with gold coins and jewels. As everyone reveled in the discovery, Gran was drawn to an extraordinary sword that was also in the room. However, when he picked it up, the ruins began to vanish, and so did the treasure. The only thing left behind was the sword. Although Gran wanted to offer the sword to the girls, they declined, and the sword remained with our protagonist. Lyria had a nightmare in which all her friends lost their lives and fell into a sea of blood. When she approached to see who was responsible for all of it, she saw herself. However, when she awoke from the nightmare, Gran comforted her, telling her that they were almost at Auguste. Lyria was excited and went to look at the scenery as they traveled. She and Lo soon became close friends, which put Catalina at ease since Lyria had never been able to connect well with others her age before. As a result, the entire island was destroyed and they had to abandon it. After remembering all this, the large bearded man destroyed Lyria's hair accessory, causing her to cry. At that moment, Gran arrived and began fighting alone against four Imperial Knights. To speed things up, the large bearded man fired a shot, but Gran managed to dodge it. At that moment, ocean currents began to rise and destroyed all the Imperial ships with one powerful force. However, the large bearded man blamed Leary for everything that happened. After that, the current created a large wave that engulfed our protagonist, but a woman named Rosetta used her plant powers and saved him. However, Leary lost consciousness and didn't wake up for hours. Rosetta explained that Leary had closed off her heart to protect herself from external hostility and, as a result, she wasn't responding. The only person who could save her was Gran, and Rosetta would guide him to an ancient entity that could help. Without a second thought, our protagonist decided to save Leary's life and set off with Rosetta towards their new destination, the Dumasi Islands. Alongside Gran, the entire group, willing to risk their lives to save Leary, joined the journey. Eventually, they arrived at Dumasi, also known as the Forgotten Island. Meanwhile, Leary kept repeating a nightmare where she caused the destruction of her friends, but each time it got worse, and the voice of a large bearded man echoed louder in her mind. On the other hand, the group had to venture into the depths of the forest, following Rosetta's lead. They arrived at a beautiful hidden place where a giant tree was surrounded by water. Upon arriving, Rosetta kindly called out to Iros, and suddenly, from that call appeared a beautiful girl who was the guardian of the sacred forest. Lyria immediately understood the situation and used her power so that Gran could enter Diria's consciousness before beginning the process. Before that, Rosetta gave the young man a hair accessory, which had been repaired by Rosetta and Bills. Inside Diria's consciousness, they tried to persuade her to return, but Diria refused. Although she didn't remember much of her past, she recalled always feeling unhappy with everything around her. It wasn't just because of the situation with the beasts, as mentioned by the bearded man, but also because she felt guilty for her impact on Catalina and Gran's lives. Catalina was a famous knight from the Empire, and because of Diria, she lost her reputation. Gran had even lost his life to save her, and that's why Diria now wanted to disappear so as not to hurt the people she cared about. She even told Gran that she would give half of her life so Gran could be free and she could disappear. However, as Gran was being cast out of Diria's consciousness, he threw the hair accessory. Seeing it, Diria stopped crying and burst out. Then Gran explained that their friends had repaired the accessory for her and that she hadn't destroyed anything. Instead, it had brought them all together on an incredible journey. This shifted Diria's mood, and the two managed to wake up. After that, it seemed that something entered Lyria's necklace. However, they then saw an imperial ship in the sky, 
and when they tried to flee, they were surrounded by a bearded man, his knights, and a group of beasts. Rosetta managed to hold off the beasts, while the others attacked and defeated the bearded man with Tiamat's help. However, it wasn't over yet, as Leviathan began to act erratically. It turned out that Leviathan was under the influence of sea pollution, and the protagonists decided to help him. Leviathan had already begun attacking the city, with many other monsters joining the assault. Although they managed to hold them off for a while, they knew they wouldn't last long, and their only option was to escape. However, our protagonist appeared and explained the situation. Leviathan had used all his power to purify the sea pollution, and now he needed to absorb other life to sustain himself. But the solution wasn't to kill the god, but to save him. Eugen and the other townspeople agreed to help. As the protagonists approached Leviathan, the townspeople prepared and began to clear out the monsters blocking their way. Along the journey, various characters with unique and special powers joined forces to defeat the monsters. However, it still wasn't enough, as a greater force, which didn't seem to originate from Leviathan, gathered all the monsters for a simultaneous attack. After several minutes of battling various monsters without finding their leader, they finally realized who the leader was. Eugen fired a shot, and the small monster leading them broke apart and stopped regrouping. This was the moment to attack Leviathan, now or never. Gran seized the opportunity and aimed his sword at the gem beneath Leviathan's mouth. The god's power began to burn our protagonist's skin, but with Diria's help, Gran managed to shatter the gem and save Leviathan. After being defeated, Leviathan merged with Diria's necklace, just like the other gods. But then, the Black Knight's puppet stole a portion of Leviathan's power, and the questions that were supposed to be answered that night remained unresolved. There was a grand celebration in the city after freedom was restored and peace returned as usual. Eugen, slightly drunk from alcohol, asked our group if he could join them, and Gran happily accepted. The next day, the now larger group set off to find their new purpose, while the villagers bid them farewell with gratitude for saving them.